Greetings, everyone. We are live again. Dynasty the Mirror Search for Huru. Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Make sure you go to dynastymirror.com. Uh, tours. I'm taking a group to Sierra Leone in April. If you're interested in rolling, hit me up. Citizenship is available for those who qualify. Again, citizenship is available for those who qualify. Also taking a group to Nigeria in August. Come and roll. Again, come and roll if you're interested in joining us. Without further ado, I have my brother, Duan Owens. Brother Owens, MMA fighter. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, on with us today, guys. As you come to the chat, as you come to the chat room, please hit that like button again. Please hit that like button as you come to the chat room. Today's uh, topic we're going to be speaking on. So I remember a long time ago when I was studying Islam. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Islam, then you have the, the Sunnis, you have Shiites, you have the Sufis, yeah, and you have the Noi, mm -hmm. the Sunnis. They say that they're the real Muslims. Right. The Shiites will claim to be the real Muslims. That's right. Then they will both say that the Sufis aren't real Muslims, and then they will say that the NOI aren't real Muslims. So then the question yep. became, who are the real Muslims? And why can't they all coexist? Mm -hmm. So now you have people who are saying, you know, I'm a Pan-African, but you aren't a Pan-African. Then you got right. this other person saying that they're the pan, real pan African, pan Africans, and they're pointing to other people saying they're not pan African. So, right. the real question, the question today is, who gave you the authority, made you the authority to decide who are the real pan Africanism? Who made you the authority of pan Africanism? That's right, brother Owens. Go ahead and take it away. So I'll say this, man. My I want to set the tone here. Something that frustrates me is um, when people knight themselves or they, they, they place themselves in a the position um, as the spokesperson for Pan-Africanism. And anytime someone has an issue with them as an individual, they take that as an affront to Pan-Africanism as an ideology. I can't tell you how many times I, I have to not only defend, but pretty much define Pan-Africanism to somebody who, you know, their exposure to it is because, you know, they don't like something about a specific individual who is a Pan-Africanist. So this is, uh, this is the, the danger when we kind of like knight ourselves and gives ourselves titles and positions within the framework. You know, um, Kwame Turo used to break down that Pan-Africanism is not just an ideology, but it's a goal. You understand? Right. This is not something just to drape ourselves in to say, you're my brother or sister in consciousness, so therefore that's it. No, we actually have work to do. So to me, the only metric of validity in terms of somebody being a Pan-Africanist is them putting in work for African people. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you know, anything else anyone else says is, is, is talk. Like, I don't want to, uh, uh, too often we, we replace church with Pan-Africanism. People will, right. they'll say the things they have to say about organized religion, which obviously, you know, we got a lot of issues with, with, with some of the dysfunction and escapism, right? But then they will do the same thing and just replace it with, you know, Egyptology, Kemetology, or any other type of, you know, you know, revisionist history or something like that. So it's it's frustrating. So essentially nobody alive is in the position to say who is and who is not uh, a Pan-Africanist. Okay. And Jose Cruz says um, his definition of Pan-Africanism is if you believe in the liberation of all black populations, you are a Pan-African to me. It's, it's, it's that simple. So and I'll, I'll, I will only add for, for, sure, for sure. And you and this doesn't this supersedes anything else. So if you are uh, like your, your your gender, your nationality or anything like that, nothing's prioritized, nothing is, is put above you being an African and fighting for African liberation. We've had Pan-Africans. Garvey was a Christian. Christian, you know, uh, Malcolm right. was, um, well, you know, practice Islam, you know, yeah. we've had, uh, you know, Pan-Africanists who put in tremendous work for African people everywhere. You know, e even our family, if, if you, if you, if we want to be clear about it, um, our Haitian family, you know what I mean? Um, right. when on game of the independence, essentially, you know, they are Pan-Africans when they say any African person who comes here is free and it's going to mm -hmm. be a land for any, you know, any, any free person that's uh, African that, that reaches here. 
Um, you know, and we understand the voodoo was their spiritual system that they used to guide their actions. So long as you put in that first, long as you understand that we African first, and Garvey made that clear. So it shouldn't be any confusion. So why do people want to overcomplicate it um, and throw in their yeah. own in the windows when it comes to Pan-Africanism? I think one thing about Pan-Africanism that kind of sets uh, the ideology apart from other things is because it, it, it shows you actually have work to do. The concrete position the African people are in the world, you know, it, it pretty much dictates that you know, because we have not actualized liberation, we still have work to do. If you, I don't want to compare it to religion, but if we do, because these are strong spiritual systems, people don't really have to do no damn work. You know, they can pray, they can say what they got to say, and then that's it. You know, but when we talk about African liberation, oh, it's shit we got to actually do. We got to actually, you know, change the power dynamic between African people and non-African people, specifically white folk. You understand? And that's scary to some people. So, you know, to, to, to admit that you have to do something, I mean, to admit that, you know, you know what's going on means you got to do something. So people will try to, you know, tear down Pan-Africanism or misrepresent Pan-Africanism. Whenever I see people that are uh, saying things, um, you know, in, in, in opposition to Pan-Africanism, what they're talking about is not even Pan-Africanism. Um, I've heard people say things like, oh, well, you know, if Pan-Africanism existed, then, you know, why does this happen? Why does that happen? And it's like, fool, you understand we're striving for something, right? You know, anything else, like just because something is not actualized now doesn't mean it's something that we don't work for. You know, or it's not it's not proof of its uh, inability to, to happen or to come to fruition. That's why we work. But again, when you're talking about people who are used to uh, escapism, you know, Pan-Africanism is, is, is really accountability. Mm -hmm. Guys, hit that like button. And what we'll, what we'll do here shortly, we'll go ahead and open up the lines. I'll put the link in the chat room and you're more than uh, welcome to call in and uh, and add to the uh, add to the discussion. This is Yoku Onuwukwe. Oh, on Wukwe says, Brother Dewan and Dinas, keep up the good work. I appreciate right. it. And shout out to Fala Jiki's uh, brother who's in the chat room. You know, Fala Jiki uh, recently passed away. Uh, my brother in Nigeria and his brother's in the chat yeah. room. Yeah. Um, is in the chat room. So shout out to uh, Fala Jiki's uh, brother who is in the, the, uh, the chat room. So mm -hmm. now, Dewan, this idea that if you call yourself a Pan-Africanism, if you subscribe to Pan-Africanism, that you can't run a profitable business and make money. Why, why, why are there people who think like that? Yeah, so the problem is the essence of Pan-Africanism is inherently anti-capitalist. But the misconception comes in when people think to make money is to be a capitalist. <laughs> right, right. Like, Besides the fact that this is the social system that we live in, and it's a system that was imposed on us, every aspect of our life is predicated by how we're situated in this economic system. To not admit that is escapism and is bullshit. So what we're not going to do, and we spoke about this uh, a while back, is use wokeness, but in this in this uh, instance, pan-Africanism, as an excuse not to put this work in, not to do what we have to do. Capitalism does not have a monopoly on uh, on abundance. You understand? We're specifically, the capitalist critique that people have, this specifically means people who work should benefit most from their damn labor and not other folk because it's not a zero-sum system that starts over again. You can pass the shit down. So it's not a direct correlation between working hard and paper. And if your wealth is, is, is gotten through death, destruction, brutality, rape, and pillaging, and you keep passing the shit down, no one will ever catch up. That's people's critique of capitalism. Now, some people are taking that to mean that anytime you're making any kind of damn money, you're you're a capitalist, or that is inherently bad. But And this is, besides being a serious mistaken analysis, this is something Dr. Amos used to always break down. This association that uh, the oppressed people have, that there's some type of damn redemptive salvation in being poor. That power is just right. the prerogative of other folk, specifically white folk, and, and the pursuit of power is inherently bad. He would break that down all the time. And, you know, of course, us thinking like that serves to benefit white folk. Mm -hmm. Guys, links in the chat room. If you'd like to call in, please click on the link. Again, if you uh, if you like to call in, please click on the link. Uh, brother, uh, brother Owens, tell us more about Pan-Africanism in action. Yeah, man, so Pan-Africanism in action, this is um, something that I mention often. Anytime if I'm doing 
um, an event or a live, I always try to throw that in there because I want us to understand that Pan-Africanism is actualized through our actions. Again, family, we actually have work to do. You know, I want to quote uh, the late, great Khalid Muhammad. He used to always say, some of us, some of us, y'all got everything on the wall, but not a goddamn thing on the ball. He would be saying, you you know, you got Africa, but you ain't putting in no work for our people. You know, it can't be just how we feel. Um, being a Pan-Africanist is not just about uh, our feelings, you know, I hate to keep doing it, but it's just so easy. I got to quote Dr. Amos one more time. He used to say, if our study of history is only an exercise in feeling good, then we'll die feeling good about ourselves. It ha we have to look at history for concrete lessons that we can learn. So when I, when I think of Pan-Africanism, or when we think of Pan-Africanism, it's to motivate us to not only build on the legacy of our ancestors, but look at the specific, um, think about the way the world is structured today. Like, it's not just about going back to the past. You can learn the lessons from the past, but we also have to be competitive. We have to get with the times. I don't mean get with the times in terms of values, because our values should never be based on some other folk doing. But in terms of um, of uh, intelligence, in, 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 in terms of how we operate, in terms of the, the structuring of the world, right? I think too often we give, um, we think anything technological or anything contemporary is whiteness. We just give that to them, even though so if much of what they control of is built off of things we created, earn, and do. Right. They just have the power to pay other folk to to orient it for their purposes. So it, it, it's funny you brought that up. It's interesting you brought that up. So we we had a discussion yesterday, and for example, skyscrapers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, vehicles. So mm -hmm. we had a brother on yesterday that was saying that you know we need to think outside of the box because you know building sky uh, skyscrapers and you know uh vehicles is how the white man does everything okay <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say this i'm sure i know i, un, I understand i believe I, I know where our brother's coming from but this goes back to like family when we talk about human organization and, and and development one thing that white folk don't do is allow the fact that somebody else came up with something stop them from benefiting from it so when we think about the the type of dominance that they have over the world and honestly what the inception of that was right the gun you know the, when they, they they're not the creators of gunpowder but as soon as they saw this they their mind uh, again always operating for warfare they said oh damn you know we can do something with this they out here you know, playing with firecrackers and doing some fly shit, but we can weaponize this. They didn't say like, oh, we're not going to use this because we didn't come up with it. We had this right. idea that there's some, one, no group of people specifically at this point in history make something on their own anyway. Besides the fact that, you know, in the way the world is globalized now, if we talk about where white folk are, are the majority, you know, where we're talking about the UK or we're talking about America, they are benefiting from, this ain't just about the labor, but the intellectual capacity of African people the world over. But again, when you're in a position of power, you can gear that towards your own goals. So why are we giving them, why are we giving them the ability to say, this is theirs, this is theirs? No, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. Not only that, when you think about uh, the way societies evolve, let's say you say, okay, and less, less about skyscrapers, but let's just say vehicles. You know, Do right. you think if there were no uh, Europeans on the planet that society would not have uh, developed alternatives that were that were that superseded that were comparative. It would be the same thing. We can we can't let our idea of uh, the construct of, of whiteness take away from uh, human capability and capacity and um and developing. We gotta we gotta be careful with that. Okay. I, and lastly, I'll say on that. Our no, history was interrupted. Okay, our history was interrupted. We don't know what we would have been ha had our history not been interrupted but regardless right. of what, this is the world we live in now so mm -hmm. there ain't no going back that's going to bring us you know to a position that's going to that alter the power dynamic because the, honestly that's all we need to be focusing on right now is changing the power differential between african people and non-african people everything else is just theory and the good theory you know it, it, sure it, it has its place it serves a purpose but ultimately it has to inform action Okay, guys, links in the chat room. If you want to call in and add to the conversation, by all means, click on the link. Uh, again, links in the chat room. If you want to click on that link, call in uh, and add to the conversation. You are more 
then welcome. Juwan, tell everybody about your uh, fighting career. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, MMA. yeah, yes, indeed. So your brother fights professionally, uh, fight MMA, um, undefeated kickboxing. I fight kickboxing as well. MMA is just a, li a little bit more lucrative. Um, I'm at that kind of at the twilight now where I'm, I'm making that transition. So I'm focusing on I've always taught self-defense seminars, but I'm, I'm focusing on that more now. Um, at this point in my development, yeah, family, the older I get, the more important um, it is. So when I'm teaching self-defense, it's primarily to combat gender-based violence. But in terms of MMA, I fought in Russia, Peru, um, Uganda, Canada three times, and not just fighting places. Like, we won belts, international fights, you know, the whole nine. But like I said, at this point, MMA is a very selfish sport. It's a young sport, and it'll, it'll yeah. force you out. So you can be smart and go out on right. your own terms. So. I'm just focusing on making that uh making that transition but i'll probably i'll probably get in there throw them things another time or two okay okay yeah i would i still haven't seen you fight live yet man i man, definitely gotta get something down there in atlanta man to stop playing you know because you were you did fight here in atlanta but you didn't let me know like i didn't find out too late it was last minute i remember that my bad fam it was last minute next time you know you know we'll do better it's all good it's all good brother so uh brother so I can't, uh you cool on, on the stream yard joint, it's not like the other joints. So if some, some come up, let me know. Okay. Uh, brother uh, Yuku was asking, what does Dewan think of Caparera and parkour in terms of practical defense? Well, I, I'll say this. Par parkour is some fly, it's fly looking. It looks dope. But in terms of actual, you know, practical combat against a resistant opponent, unless you're prioritizing escaping, I don't know how effective it is as a, as a martial system. But I got respect for it. Um, as far as uh, Caparera, I mean, obviously, family, we it deserves more respect than probably any martial system because we understand how this came about and mm -hmm. um, and the purpose that it serves. I think in terms of like a one on one fight, mm -hmm. it's tough because the way combat has evolved, there's a lot of cross training. So if, if any fighting art doesn't have a grappling component, like a serious grappling component, it's tough. You know what I mean? Like no matter what the striking art is, you know, when you put on your back, you got to know how to get up or you got to know how to deal with somebody, um, you know, on top right. of you, you got to know how to defend takedowns. But, uh, yeah, Kapu is, is a beautiful art and it has a very rich history, man. So I got a lot of respect for uh, for, for Kapu, you know, and Kapu All right. So if I were to choose, if you were to choose just one fighting style or one art, what would you recommend? Jiu-Jitsu, hands down. It's not even close. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu -Jitsu. And, and yeah, yeah, it's not it's not even mm -hmm. close. And the way I, I, I'm going to explain why, but one, let me just say, I'm not biased, but I got to do whatever works. You know, if I'm fighting right. and somebody put my ass, a professional fighting this money, I don't care what it's called. I got to do what works. But if I had to reduce it to one style, it, I want to be clear in a one-on-one -on -one situation, no. right? A one-on-one -on -one situation. If I'm in, if I'm in, a, if you're in a bar or a club, right. for sure. Now Muay Thai or something like that would be better. You know, knees, elbows, kicks. But in a one-on-one -on -one situation, grappling for sure, especially if you have a little bit of time to work with, because like. As a system, so many people, you know, uh, practice the art. So if you think of more minds committed to uh, art, it's going to develop faster. So it's the, it has now developed faster than a lot of other arts. I think um, one of the major, um, what makes it most effective is the fact that you use leverage. So it's not strength on strength. You know, you're mm -hmm. using more body parts against a larger body parts mm -hmm. against an isolated body part mm -hmm. and not only that our natural instincts in gra grappling situations is almost always wrong you know right. looking away giving up our back and uh yeah if, if you've never grappled before I i'm telling you it it's easy to watch a fight and be like oh why you know why is he holding him down nobody wouldn't hold me like that i'll just get up it's different you know what i mean there's there's 12 year old 13 year old wrestlers that'll just you know dump a grown man on his ass and just hold him down and and, and, and if you've mm -hmm. never grappled is very hard to explain but again you know your hips pressure it's it's, it's system but so yeah hands down any let me let me say this not just jiu any grappling art so whether it's wrestling judo jujitsu mm -hmm. but it's close contact and it's constant con contact with striking arts even if you're a better striker we're still mammals so if you fucking if you get hit in the head and your brain rattles against your skull you're going to get knocked out and and we call that the fluke right. factor it's just some lucky shit Anybody watching this live right, right. now can knock Mayweather out, not in a boxing fight, obviously, you know, but on some street shit, if, if some wild lands right. and land. But when it comes to grappling, there ain't no such thing as luck. You ain't going to accidentally right. submit somebody. You ain't going to accidentally get out of some shit. You understand? Right, right. 
<laughs> he said black belt of jujitsu can choke you, break your arms and legs. Guys. Yes, like indeed. that. Y yes, indeed. But I'll but I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else. So great point. But in addition to that, with the grappling, you can dictate the level of force to use. That's why I love grappling. Like one, obviously, I'm too grown to be out here. I don't you know be fighting this shit if I ain't getting paid. But if it's a serious situation, like I'm not gonna hit the person because one, I want to neutralize them. Two, I, if I hit them, I don't have control over their body. You understand what I'm saying? When you're grappling, you can dictate right. what level of force to use. With striking, Dinah, if you if you fighting somebody on the street and you don't want to, let's say your uncle is wilding at a cookout, right? Uncle is just wilding. Right. <laughs> <He's just throwing. laughs> at a cookout. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you froze up on us. Listen, so call him, but let me. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Go ahead. It was like a delay. Go ahead. Okay, so so look, so uncle is wilding, right? Now he's your uncle, uh -huh. you don't want to beat him up, but he's acting a damn fool. You know, he disrespecting women and he's right. grabbing folk. Now you can't hit your uncle soft because right. that's not gonna stop anything. So you have uh -huh. to actually fight him, but you don't want to hit your mm -hmm. uncle hard. That's why grappling right. is more effective because you can neutralize him. You know how to grapple, mm -hmm. you can take him down, get knee on belly, back control, side mount. And mm -hmm. you can neutralize them without actually hurting them. So to me, grappling yeah. is hands down the most effective uh, martial system. It's not even close. I don't care what grappling art, mm -hmm. whether it's jujitsu, wrestling, judo, sambo. But the reason I say jujitsu is because jujitsu has submissions. And you know, wrestling is cool, but sometimes yeah. you 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 know might need to really you know get somebody out the paint. All right, guys. Links in the chat room if you want to call in. Click on the link again. Links in the chat room if you want to call in. Uh, click on a link. Juwan, what you got planned for uh, 2022? What can we expect? So yeah, man, I'm um I'm, I'm teaching some self defense seminars, man. I taught I taught an MMA seminar series in Nigeria last summer, man. This shit was real fly. Um, the the MMA scene is developing over there. I might get mm -hmm. a, a you know fight in the two over summer. Like I said, I might get a, a couple more. It just depends. Y'all know I ain't trying to be dieting, you know, or running in this damn cold. But when it's summertime. You know, it's on, you know, I get in the young Wesley shape. Um, also, like I said, teaching, man, teaching this self-defense and focusing on gender-based violence prevention. Um, I got a homie in um, in London, my brother Tyrone. He runs a, a, a Bookmont Academy. It's like an online Pan-Africanist uh, Academy. You can find him on the gram. We do a lot of projects. We're going to do something called Afro Trivia. We're going to do an event out there. Um, I'm working on a conference. Wait, 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 wait. When do you plan on going to the UK? What? Well, 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 to keep it a thousand, which I'm going, I'm, I'm heading out uh, real soon. Yeah, I, I hit you up offline. But, but as far as this, okay. as far as the event, the event, event. Be summertime, maybe July. Keep, keep, keep me posted, man, because I, I need to, I need to go holler at our UK folks. You, you know? need to get out there, fam. Let me tell you, it's, it's some solid brothers and sisters doing real good work, man. The UK is, 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 you know, it's one of my favorite diasporas, man. And I, and I also think it's just because of the commonality of just being in a place where we're the numerical um what you know there there's a the dominant society larger in numbers we speak the same language so there's so many similarities um in terms of some things um ain't my favorite place to be obviously you know it's like babylon right. too you know i don't want to go right. from one of these motherfuckers to the next but you know wherever our people are we gotta you know we gotta organize man that's 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 where the work is organizing man organizing let me keep me posted on the dates because i like i like to check it out because i need to get to the uh to the UK and in Paris and Amsterdam, like I need to check out these these hubs, like as far well, as where our people are. At. But we heavy in the UK. We heavy in the UK. You know our brother. Uh -huh. Um, I, I want to introduce you to a brother again. We'll, I'll, I'll hit you up. His brother Quabina. Uh, you know, he has, has that company Asarsi. I told you about. He's in London. You know, okay. he's in London. They're doing real good work out there. Um, yeah, we got a lot of a lot of folk putting in work. Um, in London. Okay. Yeah, I got I got to get out there. I've been meaning to go, man. Like I just been straight America, Africa. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I know I, I get a lot of you know I'm getting a lot of love from our people in Amsterdam, Paris, yeah. and in the UK. I gotta, I gotta get to the Caribbean too, man. Like we, you know, we got a, a lot of times, unfortunately, in these Pan Africanist uh, circles and conversations. You know, we don't, you know, we don't speak of, of, of the Caribbean often. And to be honest not just from a music perspective but culturally they they've kept the spirit of, of resistance alive you know when a lot when it when it waned in other places you dig mm -hmm, definitely so guys again links in the chat room uh we'll, we'll wait a couple uh a couple minutes for people who want to call in uh, jamal we lost you. oh there you go all right you're back you're yeah. back you're back so um if you guys want to call and click on the link but uh anything else you'd like to share on closing in closing 
And guys, no. hit, that, hit that like button. Hold on one second, guys. Hit the like button. I mean, come on. I shouldn't be, you know, asking you guys to hit the like button. That should be done by default. You guys come to the chat room, hit the like button. Everybody watching right now, you know, it, it don't cost nothing to go ahead and hit that like button. When you see brothers and sisters putting in good work, uh, there's a lot of things our brother could be doing, but he's doing things on behalf of us to pull us together, have relevant conversations about things that are important to us. You know, we got to support each other. In addition to that, I want to say anytime you see black folk doing any work, you know the type of um, it's a thankless, it's a thankless job, you know, and it's a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. Sometimes some of the first goofy jokers you got to deal with is other black folk. So when, when, <laughs> when, when, repeat when that someone's again. doing that, re re repeat that again. When you're doing work for black folk, some of the first the first line of defense for white supremacy is a bunch of goofy ass black folk. And um, but but I'm saying that to say, um when they're committed to that it speaks it, it speaks to how committed they are you understand they're not deterred they ain't throwing their hands up you know you know we got to love some of us more than some of us are frustrated with ourselves and um that being said you know anytime you see black folk doing work supporting them it's political it's even bigger than that person right sometimes it's not even about this individual it's like you know what i'm gonna do this just on gp so this person knows you know what i mean um, that their people got you. I want to say, I want to say one more thing before we go to, uh, we're going to go to take your, take your time. Um, okay. Take your time. So yeah, Dr. Amos, as y'all, as y'all know, it's my favorite scholar. He, um, this is important to me and I'm basing it off what, 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 uh, Dinah just broke down. I want to say a quote that he talked about in terms of this work. He would say, uh, the love that we have for one another is the greatest threat to those who rule over us. Mm -hmm. And for those who rule over African people the world over, for them to stay in power, they must destroy our ability to love each other in a healthy sort of way. So when I say that, obviously I'm not just talking about romantic love, and I'm damn sure not talking about no love your enemies uh, bullshit. I'm talking about when we're putting in this work, it has to be rooted in love for black folk. So anytime you're following somebody or, or supporting something somebody doing, if they always finger wagging, of black folk, if they always tearing black folk down, talking about what mm -hmm. we're not doing and things like that, you know, just just be just be aware of that. You know, uh, we don't want to get in the habit of, 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 of victim blaming. You know, we, there is a historical basis for our positionality in the world. But at this point, regardless of how we got here, it's our duty now to, um, you know, to get out of this position. You know, we don't want mm -hmm. our, 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 our descendants to be fighting these same um, fights we have. And, and lastly, I'll say on that at this point. The type of control that African people are under, to a large degree, is predicated on us accepting the values that were imposed on us. You know, it's another thing Dr. Amos will break down all the time. So it's not just, you know, it's not physical change. It's not, you know, this type of, there is hardcore pressure. But it's much more refined. And one major pillar of that for to be effective is us just playing dumb bullshit and just delving in escapism all damn day and acting like we don't know, you know, what what time it is, you know, until something bad happened. Then we right. just want to act mad and be, you know, right. until you know, rock him back to sleep and throw him some some Negro trinkets. But let me let me let me not vent up in here. Okay. All right. So two more questions. Question number one: Should women and children all be trained proficiently in martial arts? That's question number one. Well, yeah, let me say yes, but people, all people should, but, but mm -hmm. for sure, like we should. And I'll, I'll say, I'll say that too, like in terms of uh, men, like with training comes discipline. Cause some people think like, oh, if somebody do this, they could be a more efficient, a more efficient goon. You know what I'm saying? There's discipline that comes right. with training. You know what I mean? When you, when you like the, the, the act of striving to improve is something, it really, it really does something to you. And, and when you understand the actual power of, of 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 fighting you're not so quick to damn you know fight and get physical over dumb shit you know right yes to answer this, uh, that question yes you know women should yes and another question because i get asked this as well uh your book list like what are a couple books people should pick up um yeah so so one of my favorites is uh dr amos wilson's blueprint the black power let me just say this is a mammoth text it's fucking huge but it's, it's like the Black Bible to me. So it's not something just to be read through. It's something to read on. It ain't the easiest to find, and I ain't going to find it. It is a little expensive, right? Um, but um, at this point, you know, we can get on Amazon. Yeah, oh, for sure. And you can get secondhand books from any damn web family. And not only that, like, let me just say this in terms of reading. I enjoy reading, but we all understand reading is not one of these things you can do. It's not like online where you got eight tabs at the same time. I understand people work. I get it. Like sometimes we can have this kind of like 
intellectual, this academic bouginess where we think uh, something is more legit because you got the information because you read it. I don't give a damn if you get the information from a lecture on YouTube. It's just as legitimate and it's just as valid as if you read it. You understand? So I just, I just, I just want to say that to folk, you know, because sometimes people get into, oh, I read this book, I read that book. That don't mean shit. The way you navigate in the world is not it's not altered. The way you're treating black folk ain't altered. You know, you ain't giving black folk no grace, no space. So I want to say, how do you get the information? You get the information. Um, so anything by Dr. Amos Wilson. Um, there's a book by a brother named Tom Burwell called Brainwash. Absolutely incredible. You know, his brother is not, you know, what I would consider a Pan-Africanist maybe, but he's about African people. And he used to work in the media industry, like back in the 70s. He was one of the first to basically when these white companies wanted to sell to black folk and make the shit look legit, not some cheesy shit, they hired his, his his company. But through this, this brother saw that what he calls has been a centuries long black inferiority propaganda campaign. And this book, it breaks down colorism. Just anyway, shit is rotisserie high five. Uh, Tom Burwell brainwash. Um Pedagogy of the Oppressed. This is a little bit more of an academic read, I'll be honest. But Paulo Freire, you know, he's Brazilian, he's not a brother, but but mm -hmm. again, super high fire, super thorough. He talks about the, the psychology um, that oppressed people have adopted and how our belief in that helps to maintain us in this position. So that's very, very thorough. Um, I'll say a few more. Well, I got to throw, I, any, I'll just name some authors instead. Anything by Dr. Clark, um, Dr. John Hill Clark, anything by Dr. Ben Yaka. Um, these are some, and in terms of like the contemporary, there's a brother named Dr. Tommy Curry who puts out some very thorough work. He has a book called The Man Not. He's one of the, I, I believe, the strongest contemporary writers. Uh, a lot of the newest shit, there's a lot of goofy shit out here, masquerading as, as, as you know, thorough work. What is the brother? No, I don't want to name what the fuck it, I'll name him. Ibram Kendi with this, you know, anti racist baby and stamp, all, all this type of you know, being the racial tour guide for white folk to get your bag. I'm not a fan of this type of stuff, right? Um, when you, you know, you fight to and for the community that names you, but I'm not going to get off topic. Um, Dr. Curry, Dr. Amos, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, Dr. Wilson, and everybody I name, like I said, you can um, you can just look look their stuff up on YouTube and just let it play while you're chilling, while you're doing the dishes, while you're chilling with your kids, while you're chilling with your girl or your man or whatever. Let it rock. The same way we you'll, you'll we'll listen to some dysfunction or have some damn some crazy ass reality show in the background, let that joint yeah. rock in the background. Even if you're not really into it, let that shit just kind of seep into your subconscious. So, yeah. Right. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Brother Owens, thank you so much for joining. Until next time, family. Dynasty Mirror Search Guru. Peace. All right, family. Much love and respect. Peace, peace.